So I think overall, I'm going to talk about some majorly concerning aspects of pediatric care in Houston. But I want to also emphasize that there are a lot of positive things. And there's a lot of reasons why we need to celebrate as a community as far as we've done a great job with bringing forth innovation in pediatric care. Children who have cancer are used to have a 50% mortality rate in the 70s. Now we're at 85, 90% for some types of cancers. There are more adults with congenital heart disease alive today than kids, which means that we're actually getting the kids with congenital heart disease to survive into adulthood for the first time. The mean survival for many devastating genetic infections, such as cystic fibrosis, has dramatically increased. And we've done a great job identifying a lot of life-threatening illnesses in children with our Texas newborn screening. And what is fascinating is Houston has actually been one of the major leaders in innovation in pediatric health care. We live in the biggest medical center in the world, uh, or we have in Houston the biggest medical center in the world. And we regularly do, or you know, discover new things that really will benefit uh, kids. In fact, in the Chronicle yesterday, there was a big article. I feel like every day I look in the Chronicle, there's something else about the benefits of uh, Houston and pediatric care. Um, this was the first patient, an adolescent patient, who had a total artificial heart replacement because he had heart failure, and that was done here in Houston. So we really are uh, contributing to the research and pediatric innovation. That is something we should really be proud of as a city. The problem is, you have access to this. If you have access to this care, you're going to have uh, great health. If you don't have access to this care, which we're going to talk about, then you're facing, you know, huge problems in your in your health care and your health coverage. And that's something that we're going to talk a lot about. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is access to care. And I love this poster. This is a, an advertisement by the American Academy of Pediatrics that says we shouldn't have to fight to get the health care we deserve. And it's true. Kids have no voice with the legislature. They don't get to make decisions about Medicaid and, and the way medical homes are set up. We have to do that for them. And it is a fight a lot of the times to try to get them to see their pediatrician. So Texas, unfortunately, leads the nation in uninsured children. Out of all 50 states, we have the highest percentage of kids who don't have access to care, don't have any health insurance. We're currently at 1.5 million children, or 22%, uh, twice the national ever average. And many of these kids are actually eligible for Medicaid, 700,000 or 500,000, depending on who you talk to. And it's unfortunate that we're not helping them get enrolled and have access to care. Now, you ask, well, what about the other kids? You said 1.5 aren't you know, insured and only 700,000 are Medicaid eligible. Well, most of those are kids who are, their parents are working. They make too much money to qualify for Medicaid or CHIP, but now only 46% of employers are providing insurance for their employees' children. So that's a huge gap and a lot of kids aren't getting insurance for that reason. We have 3 million children who are on our Medicaid and CHIP program and they're actually overall a pretty good deal. So 66% of Texas Medicaid population are kids, but that only accounts for 43% of the Medicaid funds. So for the most part, it's a pretty effective system. Uninsured children have a lot of health problems. There has been many, many studies that have shown that they're you know, less likely to have all their immunizations. They're more likely to have problems with recurrent infections. So not only are they having problems focusing in school because of their oral health, but because of their sore throats, their ear infections, other things that they don't get care. They have more school absences, and therefore their parents can't go to work. And so it's actually all around bad for the family. And they're more likely to use emergency rooms for their routine care and get hospitalized for things that could have been prevented, which ends up costing us as a community more money in the long run. Great, or less than 50% of kids in Texas have a medical home. Only, you know, less than 50% of kids in Texas and in Houston have a primary pediatrician that they see regularly. And you know, it's really good that, that Harris County has done a better job at enrolling kids in Medicaid. You can see here, this is the graph looking from 2001 to 2009 of the number of children who are currently enrolled in Medicaid. And we've gone from just over 100,000 to now over 400,000. How many children are there in Harris County, by the way? I think I heard it, one, over 1 million, right, or about 1 million, and 400,000 of them are on Medicaid, and plus another you know, 100,000 or more that are eligible. So half of our kids here in Houston are qualify for Medicaid, and I think that's important because 
the number of pediatricians in Houston who actually accept Medicaid is really dropping. So you can see that in 2000, it was about over 60%. We're down to 40% of pediatricians who actually accept Medicaid patients. And the problem is, is that's in, anticipated to go down further, especially with all of the debate about Medicaid and the Texas legislation. A lot of people are worried that regular pediatricians aren't going to be able to deal with the low reimbursement rates and the extra paperwork, and they don't want to accept these kids and be able to provide care. What makes it worse is not only can these kids not get primary care, but they also can't get any specialty care. So kids who break their arm and need an orthopedic surgeon to fix it, or kids who have asthma and need to see a pulmonologist, a, a lung specialist, they can't get in. This is a really interesting article that just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple weeks ago where they had mystery shoppers. So they had parents or people posing as parents call both um, you know, the same subspecialist offices and they at first told them about their child and said they had private insurance. They called two weeks later, same scenario, only they had Medicaid. And what is interesting is that this study really showed that there are significant disparities in provider acceptance of Medicaid and CHIP patients. 66% of Medicaid CHIP callers were denied an appointment, compared to 11% of privately insured patients. And among six, uh, sorry, 89 patients or 89 clinics that accepted both Medicaid and private insurance, there was a delay in the Medicaid patients for 22 days longer they had to wait to get their appointment than patients who were, had private insurance. So that's not very good. So and I, what I'm worried about and what makes me worried about the immediate future for Houston children is that this trend is going to get worse. Again, economic problems continue. We're going to have more and more patients who are going to have, you know, their parents have less money and so they're going to qualify for Medicaid. Health reform, more kids are supposed to be eligible for Medicaid in 2014. How is our system going to be able to provide for them? How are the, we're going to have enough pediatricians to be able to take care of them? And again, our 82nd Texas legislative session, which was painful in a lot of ways, underfunded Medicaid by $4.8 billion. Now, they're going to have a significant more you know, reimbursement cuts for the elderly and people in, on, who with disability and in nursing homes than for kids. So the kids were somewhat protected in the end. But it's still not good, and it's not good press. And pediatricians are wary of that, and they don't want to take as many Medicaid patients. So what can we do as a community? Well, one, we need to make the health of our children a priority. We need to recognize, just like what we've heard about in all these other wonderful presentations, that the children are the future. And 50% of Houston children who are poor and qualify for these services need access to care. And so we need to value medical homes, educate communities, have incentives for primary care providers, such as loan reimbursement, or um, try to give them incentives to go into primary care, and really focus on the vulnerable populations. We must make access to care a priority moving forward, and I am very encouraged by the fact that there are so many people working on this issue in our community. We have a number of wonderful vaccines, and we're discovering new ones all the time. The vaccines that have been discovered since 1980, diphtheria, mumps, measles, pertussis, polio, and rubella, have had an over 92% reduction in cases and over 99% reduction of deaths. That's huge. It's one of the greatest public health in, you know, interventions that we have. Vaccines since 1980, we're also seeing a huge decline. Hepatitis A, B, haemophilus, influenza, and varicella, we've had an 80% reduction of cases and deaths. And we've also had declines in our more recently um, developed vaccines, such as pneumococcus, rotavirus, meningococcal disease, HPV. They're very effective vaccines. Now, I graduated from medical school in 2005, and in my brief time of training and, and being a pediatrician, I have seen all of these diseases myself, treated patients myself with these vaccine-preventable diseases. That shouldn't happen when we can, they are so preventable. And very sadly, those in red are patients that I've treated who have died from these vaccine-preventable illnesses. And that just shouldn't happen in our community when vaccines are so available and patients should be able to receive them and none of these deaths should have happened in our community. So I now look at how many kids in, in Houston actually have their vaccines. And so this is looking at children 19 to 35 months who have completed their primary vaccination schedule. And it's actually better than it looks. So the national average is about 70%, 72, 75%, depending on who you look at. And really by 2006, Houston had made significant progress, right? In 1988, we were at 11% of people who in, were 19 to 35 months actually had their complete vaccination series. And we got up to very close to the national average. 
coverage. Now, 2008, 2009 is a little unfair because we had some vaccine shortages, which probably negatively impacted our rates. But for the most part, Houston you know, has almost caught up to national trends, which is good. And with adolescent vaccines, we're actually slightly better than the United States. At 42% of um, Houston children have their catch-up adolescent vaccines compared to the US. But why isn't this 100%? 100% of these illnesses should be preventable. So access to a vaccine provider is very difficult. And in Houston, there are a lot of providers who see patients to provide their general pediatric care, and they refer them to someplace else to get their vaccines. Well, that shouldn't happen. It's hard for people to take off of work and take their child to the doctor. And nobody should have to choose between vaccinating their child and getting their preventative health care. Um, vaccine availability, we have shortages. When flu vaccines come out, I know you all know that some offices have vaccines, some don't. You have to constantly call around. Education on vaccines, and then there are huge misconceptions about vaccines in an anti-vaccine movement. From USA Today, from a couple weeks ago, childhood diseases return as parents refuse vaccines. And there are actually some outbreaks of vaccine preventable illnesses going on right now. Just to let you know, um, everybody aware of what happened in California over the past year where there was a huge outbreak of pertussis or whooping cough with 10 infant deaths. Babies are too young to get the vaccine. They can't defend themselves by having the vaccine. We need to be as a community vaccinated to prevent this disease in these, in these babies. And we have shown with our research at Texas Children's and also research in California that kids or Hispanic children are much more at risk of having um, bad effects of pertussis and have an increased risk of dying from pertussis. And since we have so many babies who are Hispanic, we're very worried that in Houston that could happen as well. Texas had 25% of the pediatric deaths from the H1N1 influenza. And there's been recently measles in Harris County. There's actually a big measles outbreak going on across the country. And you can see at the bottom, Texas, so far we've only had six cases, a couple of which were in Harris County. So these diseases are here, and we need to just do a good job of preventing problems or trying to immunize patients so that they don't have these problems. We need to educate and, and have an increased campaign for immunizations, increase providers, improve our immunization registry use. And we were so close to getting a bill passed this session to really improve our registry and it failed at the last minute by the House, but we'll work on it again. We've worked on it for many years in a row. And again, Houston must make immunizations for our children a priority. The obesity trends in Texas are very alarming. So in 1990, you can see 57% of adults were of normal weight. Now, in 2009, actually, the most recent data, 33% of adults are of normal weight, whereas 37% are overweight and another 30% are obese. 60% of the Texas population are either overweight or obese. And that's happening in kids, too. Um, we're ranked sixth in the nation in childhood obesity. One in three Texas children is overweight or obese, and that's 50% of Hispanic children. So again, we heard about earlier about how Hispanic children are more at risk, and that's clearly what we see. Um, in 2005, or I'm sorry, these children have a greater than two-thirds chance of staying obese when they're 35 years old. So as a pediatrician, I hate that I'm handing over these kids who are 20 years old who already have diabetes and high blood pressure and problems with their self-esteem and all the things that come with obesity to inter internists. They're supposed to have these diseases when they're 60, not 20, and that's really scary for me. Um, and with, in 2005, obese adults cost Texas businesses um, $3.3 billion per year. That is going to skyrocket because today's obese children are poised to triple Texas's current obesity rates in adults in the, by the year 2040. And we're gonna, not going to be able to pay for all the diabetes and high blood pressure and those things. So this is looking at the percentage of kids in Harris County who are obese and overweight. You can see it's increased um, significantly to now over 30%. And what is more scary is you can look at the fourth graders. They're actually, you know, 40% or more are either overweight or, or obese. And as those kids move through, we're going to have more and more kids who have problems with obesity. Obesity affects every aspect of physical, emotional, and social health. I'm going to skip through the details, but um, it's a very devastating condition. As I told about, not only is it a problem for the individual, but for society. In Texas, the cost of diabetes in 2010 was 15.6 billion. In 2040, that's anticipated to be 39 billion. We're not gonna be able to pay for this. And then most sadly to me, this generation could be the first not to outlive their, pa their parents. 
if we're if they're starting out their adult life with such problems with diabetes and high blood pressure and they're needing kidney transplants or liver transplants at a really early age from their obesity they're going to die before their parents and that's unacceptable especially when we have all of this wonderful innovation in pediatric health care overall so why do we have a problem combination of genes and, and environment increased calories decreased activity lack of health education and then food security we just heard about how all, we have such a big problem with food insecurity so how can you go hungry and still be obese? How much does an uh, individual serving of, not Kraft, but you know, any generic brand of macaroni and cheese cost? Anybody throw it out there? I think I heard nine, 10 cents. Yeah, 10 cents. How much does an uh, individual serving of salad cost? It can be two, three dollars per serving. This is a big problem, and patients or parents who don't have a lot of money are gonna buy high calorie satisfying foods, which lead to obesity. So finally, there are six essential changes that we as a community need to make, and the CDC recommends that. Decrease sugar, sweetened beverages, decrease consumption of calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods, decrease TV time, increase fresh fruits and vegetables and physical activity, and increase breastfeeding initiation, duration, and exclusivity. And I don't have time to go through all of my strategies, but there are a lot of people in Houston working on this, and I feel for the first time this issue is getting enough awareness that we can really make a difference.